Hey, so it looks like we're going to be seatmates for this really long flight. Yeah, and since I'm in the middle seat, just remember, I get the armrest. Uh, I guess, though, I do think we could share. Also, hey, listen, your bag is taking up all my legroom. You think you could move it? Uh, sorry. I'm taller than you, and I need the space for my legs. All right. I appreciate that, but I did pay for the space. Uh, also, that air vent of yours is blowing freezing cold air on me, and, and not, not you. you. Can you adjust it? Well, no. I paid for it, so I'll cool whatever part of the plane I like. Well, so much for looking out for each other. Oh, I'm looking out for you. I'm looking to make your flight as hellish as mine. Do you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to No Vacancy with me, Glenn Hausman. I'm so excited to be here with you once again. We're getting towards the dark day, dog days here of summer. Summer's coming to an end. I'm starting to notice the days are getting a little bit darker, a little bit earlier. It's getting that nice chill in the evening that makes you want to sit around a fire and have some s'mores and kind of hang out. But most of the time, I don't actually get to spend outside. I get to spend time inside recording great podcasts like this one. But I got one guy out here who loves uh, the outside. And I've got our, ourselves uh, Jet Set and Jeff Polly over there. How are you, sir? Hey, how's it going? I'm doing pretty good. No, How about really, yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Good to, uh, good to have you here on the No Vacancy Podcast. And be sure to follow me at Traveling Glenn on Twitter, on uh, Instagram. And if you want to drop us a note, drop us a note at Glenn at Rouse.media. And I got to tell you, Jeff, it's, uh, it's fun to be here. I'm thinking of taking the kids to Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey next week. Roller coaster. Yeah, totally roller coaster time. I made uh, made lots of promises to these guys that they're going to go and ride some uh, some giant ones. I'm just hoping that uh, my stomach can can handle it. I'm 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 not as good as I used to be with these things. That right down the right down the road. Now that I live in Ventura, right down the road is Magic Mountain, and every time I pass it, I see. I mean, it looks like it's a CGI theme park in a movie because there's so <laughs> many rides and. I haven't taken the opportunity to go ride it yet, but uh, uh, I'll just throw up in garbage cans and then go on the next ride. I don't care about my stomach. <laughs> well, I think that's great. Last summer, I went to Hershey Park with the family, and uh, we got one of those skip the line passages for the roller coasters, and we went boom, 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 roller coaster after roller coaster, and I did like six or seven of those in a row, and I was feeling like death. It was not a pretty sight. So I'm hoping that uh, when I go to Great Adventure this coming week, it's not going to be as, as terrible. Though, going on that King Dakar Ka roller coaster, the tallest roller coaster in the United States, nay, maybe the world, that should, be, uh, that should be an interesting experience. That sounds pretty sweet. I wish I could be there. Well, fly in. Go with us. You know, it'll be, uh, it'll be kind of fun. I need somebody to sit next to anyway because I've got the boys, i got me, and then I'm going to have one big uh, empty seat. So, Well, that works perfect because uh, if I need to yak, I'll just turn to your – your side and you know, <laughs> yak on you. <laughs> well, I can picture both of us yakking simultaneously and knocking each other's yak off the sides of the uh, the roller coaster. So, all right, I guess uh, <laughs> I guess that's a great topic for us to talk about. Just our now, uh, now that we've now that we've talked about yakking, I know everybody is thinking about that scene from Stand by Me. So, <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, go rent the movie and, uh, and, and then you'll know what I'm talking. about. Well, what do you know? Uh, I feel like this whole conversation was a big mistake. And speaking of giant mistakes, we're going to talk about top social media marketing mistakes that are that are going out there. Ones you shouldn't do, ones you shouldn't avoid, and ones that you should make sure that you stay very, very far away from. Jeff, you know, this is something that um, people keep telling me that I'm good at social media, and I feel like I have zero confidence when it comes to this whatsoever. I. I I just hope that we're the right people to be uh, providing all of this this great advice today. No, I think that you definitely are. I'm, uh, I, you know, I keep on with the trends. I, I I like a lot of companies on my social media and and kind of follow what they do and and see what works and see what doesn't work. So 
while I may not be a actual social media manager like such as yourself and offer these services, I think that I'm a, you know, in that age range at 41 where I'm there, you know, wheelhouse customer bracket demographic. And I keep, you know, apprised of the trends that are going on. So I see what you know, what works and what doesn't work. And, and, uh, and like I said, like you said, anyway, uh, a lot of people like what you're doing on social media. Uh, I know I've seen what you do on social media for companies and, uh, you know, you're definitely the right person to talk about. And <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little bit learned on this. Uh, well, thanks for saying that. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that we failed to, to do is, is realize that we should, you know, really think these things through, understand what our goals are. Everybody thinks that, uh, social media is just a matter of sending out lots of, uh, tweets, but everything has to have a framework. Everything has to have an understanding. Everything must have a social media sh- strategy. And uh, Jeff, I find a lot of companies don't really seem to get that very basic idea that you you have to understand inherently who you are and how that needs to be reflected in the way that you approach your social media campaigns. Right. Well, the first thing that I want to say is I don't care how big you are or how small you are. In today's day and age and marketing, if, if you want to build your business, you have to have a social media marketing strategy. So uh, if you're a one person organization and, and you're and you're fledgling, you still have to spend the time in, in now to 2017. You still have to spend the time to hit these the right social media for your customer. So uh, you're absolutely right. You know, making a social media marketing strategy is the first thing that, you know, a lot of people miss. They they think that their marketing strategy on social media is. I signed up for Facebook and I signed up for Twitter. <laughs> that's that's my strategy. And, and, and it gets a little bit more involved in that, right? Right. Yeah, ab- absolutely. That doesn't make, a, that, that doesn't make a, a lot of sense to me to just say that that's what you've done. But it's true. I hear that all the time, Jeff. People are like, uh, you know, why am I not having any success? I'm like, well, what are you doing? And they don't really have a clear, coherent answer about what they're doing. Right. And, you know, a lot of people sign up for, you know, they'll, they'll say my social media marketing strategy is that I'm going to create a Facebook page and they'll come up with these 10 bursts and, and it's their super launch for their page. And they've got great pictures of their product or a small little video of their product or whatnot. And then within a week to two weeks, they've completely died out and they've got nothing more to post. And, and, and that's kind of what we're talking about with social marketing strategy. You can't just have your 10 posts for your first two weeks and then expect people to, to build a following off of that. You have to have a, a consistent plan. Uh, let's call it one week, one post a week, two posts a week, one post a day, depending on how much time you want to invest in it. And, and, and that's, again, what we're talking about with social media. Uh, right. Marketing. All right. So that first step, understand what your goals are. What is the rationale, the reasoning behind what you're doing and why you're going to, to do it? Without that, you're going to be pretty, pretty messed up. So then your second step is really understanding who you're going to be appealing to. Right, Jeff? Yeah. Target audience. You know, uh, again, I'm 41 might white male. Well, I like uh action sports and extreme sports and stuff like that. So obviously, you know, they're going to target me. And and I see it all the time where companies uh, just kind of throw it out there and try to hit every, you know, little number on the dartboard where you need to be more localized than that. You need to understand who your customer is. And this just obviously doesn't just relate to social social media, but kind of everywhere, but specifically social media, you need to understand, you know, the, the average demographic of, of who your customer is, what they like, who they are, uh, what they're spending their time on social media doing. Are they watching, you know, videos of funny kittens or, or, you know, cute babies or, or whatnot. And then you develop your, your, your strategy on, 
your target audience. So what we're talking about is it's not just understanding specifically why they like your brand and why they want to interact with your brand, but the psychographic of that customer and what is their lifestyle and what are the things that they enjoy in their lifestyle. So how do you bring all of those different things together to a clean, cohesive program that works within your, your social media strategy? Isn't, isn't that kind of right, right, right Jeff? Yeah, that's exactly right, and so much more eloquently put than I... I <laughs> well, you know, my secret plan is to just take what everybody else says, then just kind of reframe it, and it makes it sound like I actually know what I'm talking about. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for all of that. Um, so you, you've got to figure out, like I said, and Jeff said, uh, you know, w- w- who is your target audience? And then you need to develop um, interactions with those people that play within that realm. And uh, the most dangerous thing that I think people do, Jeff, is making it all about them let's just use a hotel for example if it's just going to be promoting your specific hotel every single time i think people are going to lose interest pretty darn quickly yeah and that's you know that was one of our things on our on top of our list is promoting yourself a lot i see it all the time where a company only posts about a specific product that they've just done or or a project that they're working on or something like that and you're not going to captivate the audience that you want to in social media by just posting about that. You have to, you know, uh, post insightful, you know, articles. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the industry that you're exactly in or the product that you're actually selling. You're, you're trying to generate a buzz about who you are and, and that relates to who you are personally, who you are business wise, who you company mantra, whatever and and it's imperative that you don't just focus on your company and its product. Right. That's absolutely right. For example, I'm, you're listening here to the No Vacancy Podcast, and I love that you guys are all here uh, listening to what we have to say today. But if I was to only go out there and pr- push tweets and push Instagram photos and my Facebook page solely about who the next guest is or listen to this episode, you're going to immediately tune out my feed because it's not going to be interesting. It's not going to be fresh. And soon enough, it's not going to be relevant to your lifestyle. So looking at my last number of posts uh, this morning, Jeff, I posted an article on uh, what airports were like 30 years ago, right? Has nothing to do with uh, this show. It has, you know, nothing to do with any of that. I, re- uh, I-, I retweeted um, an article from a, uh, you know, from a-, a company that I found was interesting that I happen to have uh, written, which was, has to do with uh, design and lobby furniture, right? I, I, prom- I put up an article on top American chain restaurants as per Business Insider magazine. I put up a photograph of a controversial T-shirt I saw when I was uh, in Israel a few weeks ago, and I posted the recent numbers from Lodging Econometrics on their pipeline. Nowhere did I post anything about um, the No Vacancy podcast. I will later today when this episode is out, but... You gain, I think, trust and um, a relationship with the people that are following you on social media by giving them 80, 90 percent information that's relevant to their lives and a little bit of taste uh, of what you're doing as well. Yeah, I see it all the time where, again, we're we're saying the same exact thing. But, you know, uh, to your article that you posted this morning about travel 30 years ago at an airport, I, I, I woke up this morning and I got on Facebook and I, I was seeing through it and I saw that post and I remember those days. So I wanted to read that article and I sat there with my morning coffee and I read that article, uh, you know, and, and enjoyed it immensely. And it had nothing to do with you, but no. I guarantee you, I guarantee you when I, when I got done with that, that I'm going to like your company just a little right. bit more or remember it just a little bit more and 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 you build on top of that and and that's our next our next problem what that I see is spamming and you know we are constantly inundated with spamming and and it goes to the same kind of topic of of promoting yourself too much but you can't just post an article and expect people to read it and and then it just goes away forever these things stay forever and people are commenting on them and everything and what they really want you to do as a company is engage in the conversation bring up you know interesting topics and interesting tidbits about the world about you know things that are important to you stuff like that that you you know that again generate a buzz about who you are and what you do right 
Ab- absolutely. And um, if you don't do that right, then you're going to be you're going to be dead in the water. If you're uh, if you're a hotel, I think a great way for you to engage readers is talk about your destination. Don't just talk about um, what's at your property, everything that's happening within the area. You know, it's uh, it's, I, it's if, if I owned a hotel, I would literally have the calendar of events uh, open all the time in my local area. And I would promote the the local beer festival that's coming right. up or, or whatnot, you know, anything that, anything that is of relevance that gathers right. a crowd, I would, I would throw it out there and say, Hey, you guys are going to be out there. We'll, you know, we'll be around kind of thing. And, uh, you know, kind of comes to our next topic, which is, is the exact opposite of spanning. And that's too little interaction. Right. Um, <laughs> you can't go overboard and you definitely don't want to not, do anything besides sign up for the Facebook account. So, uh, you know, it can be used, social media can obviously be used as a banner space, but in reality, it's social media. So you got to have that, those conversations and engagement. You can't just, again, you know, post a couple things every month and expect people to build off of you for, you know, because you have a, uh, you know, a great design of your product. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what you want to do is you really need to, to foster that interaction with people. If somebody expresses interest in something you've done and comments on it, you need to get back to them. You need to respond to them and you need to be uh, an active participant in the conversation in order to drive engagement. If you don't drive engagement, then what's the point of doing this anyway? Right. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, this is this is our next topic on the list, but mm-hmm. a lot of people have that set it and forget it mentality and yep. they think it, they think that their Facebook page will run on its own because, you know, they have hundreds of employees. And obviously these employees want to like the, the, the company Facebook page Im- immediately because they love the, working for the company so much. And, and they're going to post every day on it. And that's just not the way it works. Social media is, again, being social. So you can't just l- l- put it out there and expect people to engage in it. You have to go out there and engage yourself. Uh, to get those fans into it. Yeah, and what, some of the clever things I've done is I've actually seen um, brands reach out to me based on stuff that I've posted that in the end would help them. For uh, example, I put up something, um, took pictures of a dinner that I went to where we had a lot of sushi, right? And I took uh, some great photographs of the, the, the sushi. All right, it wasn't great photographs. It was my old phone. The photo, the photo quality sucked. But I have that new phone now, so the pictures are much better. But that being said, um, I put up those pictures in a sushi restaurant in Manhattan you know, interacted with me. Oh, what's your favorite type of sushi? Do you like this? Do you like that? What kind of sake do you like? And it wound up having a nice back and forth conversation and they were able to leverage my following for their end result by engaging in non-selling type of conversation. I thought that to be fun. I thought that to be interesting. And it's something that happens pretty regularly. Yeah. Uh, you know, forgetting to, ver- to diversify is is one of the biggest problems with companies on uh, on social media you know your own blog posts articles videos photos uh links to external content that's relative yep. to your audience interests and one of the biggest things i think is shares and retweets from other players in your niche and mm-hmm. and that's you know i'll use you as an example glenn i have met and and connected with people on social media that i've never met in real life. I right. have no idea who they are just by sharing your post or, or, or an article or something like that. And, you know, we've connected on social media for the simple fact that we share the similar interest of, you know, what airports were like 30 years ago. And, and we had an engaging conversation about it. Um, right. So, so yeah, don't forget to diversify. Right. And those retweeting other people's articles shows you're engaged with them and you're more likely to build a following and be able to start to leverage their yeah. followers as well. Yeah, there is there is no shame in retweeting a great article by one of your competitors. Uh, you know, it's it's the ability to try to connect with those people that already are connected to your competitor and maybe they'll connect with you. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. And as far as competitors go, hey, especially in our business, there's more than enough room for everybody on the hotel media side of business and in the hotel industry. So, 
you may be competing against each other, but I see everybody hanging out at all the major conferences. They're all friends. Treat it that way online as well. We can all work together to rise the tide and all be more profitable and successful. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I do have to comment because I don't believe I'm going to be able to edit this out, but I have a sick dog and yes. you can hear you can hear him in the background. And uh, unfortunately, he's crying a little bit. So I apologize to all the listeners for my uh my sick dog wanting to interject on our social media conversation. And I want to be clear that the dog is not crying because he's listening to the No Vacancy podcast. I just want to get that. <laughs> I just want to make sure <laughs> that's out there. The dog is a big fan of the podcast and, uh, you know, it got all of its dog friends to sign up. So you should get your dog friends to sign up for the show, too. All right. So what's uh, the next issue that you think is important? Uh, not, you know, we have posted all this stuff. And we're getting it out and it's all diversified and it's getting out to the right people. But you got to track analytics. Right. And and if you don't, then your ROI on your social media makes means nothing. And whether you're the smallest of small or biggest of big, especially if you're the biggest of big, obviously you have someone else that you have to, you have to justify why you're spending this time on social media uh, and, and analytics is the, is the best way to do that. It, it shows you exactly who's clicking and what they're doing and why they're doing and demographics and engagement. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really, really big thing about social media that you need to learn or you need to have the right people in place right. to help you process that data. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make with um, social media overall is thinking that we could do it ourselves, thinking that we're going to be geniuses and be able to handle it. Um, I, no matter how decent I might be at it, um, I definitely always feel like I would be doing better if I was working with someone who's professionally engaged in this as well. Well, and I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is, again, uh, I'm Joe Schmo and I'm the director of marketing of, of my company and oh yeah, I can sign up for a Facebook and a Twitter and people automatically follow me. And, and the biggest misconception is, it, you know, social media, depending on the size of the company is at least a part-time job. You know, yeah. you can, you can easily and, and, and see major benefits by benef by don't, you know, by dedicating like 10 hours a week to it. So is that 10 hours a week out of your normal 40? Are you adding it on to your normal 40 or 60 or 70 or whatever you work? Or do you go out and hire, uh, you know, a, a social media company that specializes in this, that can put the 10 hours a week in time, or do you hire an actual, you know, so social media marketing manager that, you know, is a full-time person that can really devote their entire time to this process. Right. And I think that depends on uh, a, a lot of factors. So the tips I would give you is if you're talking about a single select service property, you're probably talking about just getting someone to help out for a little bit. If you own multiple properties, you might be talking about having somebody work part time to full time. And you're certainly looking at full time if you've got a, a, a major resort or a series of properties that fall within that larger all encompassing umbrella. Right. And there's and there's different levels of who you can hire or or who you can utilize, you know, whether it's it's the the employee that's already in house that you notice has a, you know, a knack for social media on their personal page that might want to help out or whether it's, you know, jumping on a one ad in your local area looking for, you know, a student that just graduated and then what really wants to get into social media, you can kind of go that route or whether it's someone, you know, I'm going to plug you there, Glenn, that, you know, needs a little bit more spe specialization, needs that professional touch that can hire, you know, Rouse Media or a company like that to truly, you know, develop their strategy for them and then, you know, right. constantly put out good material. Right. And that's, that's something, you know, not to give the big sell after saying not to do a lot of selling on the social media. But if somebody does want any uh, assistance with that, we can help create a pathway to excellence for you and you could facilitate it yourselves. So, um, you know, give us a call, drop us a line, Glenn at rouse.media or at traveling Glenn on Instagram and Twitter, or just find us at no vacancy podcast on, uh, on Facebook. But, um, one of the other things that I, I find is a great, is a great success tool is I happen to use a, um, 
an aggregator like Hootsuite. Um, that's actually the one I use. It allows me to post on multiple platforms at once. It allows me to schedule posts. So, for example, um, Jeff, when we were at uh, the AHOA conference shooting the live podcasts from there back over in the spring, um, I set up a lot of um, – you know, social media things ahead of time to alert people. Hey, at one o'clock, we're doing this interview at one thirty, We're doing that interview. Come check this out. Come check that out all to help engage people. And I don't have to be sitting there doing it in, in real time. So that's a very yeah, helpful ab- thing. Absolutely. Super helpful tool, but it's also one of the, one of the things that we'll try to say that can be easily become a negative and you should veer yes. away from is, is setting, setting up a consistent auto post of, yep. of your, of your posts and, and just do it, you know, set it up for once every two weeks or whatever. And it's the same drab and, and you can kind of, you can really easy get yourself into that, you know, pigeonholed of doing that. And, and, oh yeah, I've got a social media thing. It's this great program that posts for me every two weeks. And, and that's a, that's a big mistake that you can do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So try to stay away and avoid doing that kind of stuff because you want people to take you seriously. And, and honestly, people are going to see right through it. They're going to be like, oh, this person is phoning it in. I'm not going to be engaged with that brand. I'm just going to phone in my love for that brand and go to the guy down the street who's connecting with me on multiple levels from the content that I want to absorb to making me feel good about the decision of, of following them. Right. Yeah. I, and so I think the, you know, one of the last things that we should talk about is the dreaded, um, dreaded negative feedback on social media and, and how to deal with that because, you know, there are lots of ways to deal with it. There some are good, some are bad, some are meh. And, and, you know, I see a lot of, uh, people do the wrong thing constantly constantly and it's not necessarily the experience you're going to have when you're in the hotel environment it amazes to me how um i could have a negative interaction with the brand online but if i was to stay in that hotel and i had something go wrong and i brought it to the front desk's uh, attention they would immediately apologize and try to reorganize the situation fix it and make me feel good about itself. But that's not necessarily what happens when it comes to online. There's too much defensiveness. There's too much avoiding of the issue and there's not enough copying to the mistakes that are being made. Yeah. So I think we created a little bit of a list, a little sub list inside this list, uh, talking about the different types of problems or, or that people can kind of find themselves in, in social media Mm -hmm. And the first one is not addressing these negative comments right. written on your profiles. You can't just ignore these. Like I said, they stay there forever. So, uh, so even if it is the craziest of the crazy review or negative post or whatever, it it pays off better in the long run to address it than to just you know ignore it completely. And think about the way that you interact with brands. I'm sure, for example, that you've had a negative experience happen to you with the brand at some time in your life. And what did they do? If they ignored the situation or made it feel like it was your fault, you totally disconnected with that brand. But Absolutely. if they cop to the problem, fix the problem, and made you feel good about that, my guess is not only did you feel better about it, but you're probably become more loyal to the brand and wanted to share that story with your friends and family. And that is what your audience will do if you, if you deal with it right online. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, uh, another thing about ignoring, you know, some people might be saying right now, Oh, I can just delete the negative comment. You, you can't do that either. You can't, you can't discredit it. You do not control the message on your Facebook or, or your social media feed. Uh, the only thing you can do is try to confront it and and not you don't have to make that person happy again or 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 say something perfectly to to change their opinion of you right then and there. Uh, but I think it's important to confront it, say that you understand there is a problem and 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 try to be proactive in in fixing or coming to a solution right just interact with those persons as a decent human being i hate yeah, to have be, to say something so simple but sometimes that's lost on people in the heat of the moment be real you know that's a it's a great great way of saying it you yeah. know faking that customer interaction you know it's it's just going to advocate or 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 expand to 
the negativity to other people that are looking at that feed because we all love it. We all love a good train wreck. I don't, you know, necessarily see a, a review of something that's good and read through all the comments on that review. But if something's really bad, then I'm going to click on those comments oh, and yeah. see what other people say. And, you know, I want to, I, I want that soap opera in my life and I'm not the only one out there that does that. And so, so, you know, by engaging in the person in a, in a, you know, defensive way or, or anything like that, that really lends itself to opening up a, a kind of Pandora's box in social media. And that's the last thing you want. Uh, that is the last thing you want. And remember, you don't have control over uh, how people are going to behave and react and, and all of that. You have to chill out. Just deal with it. It's going to be okay. But if you're a good person and you respond with everything in that kind of framework, the, everything will happen positively for you. Uh, I hate right. to sound like all karma there, but the more positive energy you put out in the universe, the more you're going to get, you're going to get back in response. Yeah. You know, I think you and I have touched on it more than once or, uh, you know, in our conversations on how amazing the Wendy's social media has gotten in the last oh, yeah. six months to a year. Um, you know, whoever they've hired to do that is, is doing an incredible job. I, I don't like Wendy's product. You know, sometimes I eat it out of necessity and sorry, Wendy's, sorry, if you're a future sponsor of no, well, I wanted to tell you but, as a former uh, Wendy's employee, I'm uh, offended, <laughs> but, but the very fact that they take all their negative reviews or all their competitors, you know, bashing them with with a grain of salt and and add a little humor to it and and they're standing up for themselves but not in a defensive way but more sarcastic funny kind of oh you don't like this we're going to solve this problem by doing this way is is really creating a, a great following for them but it only works for them because that is what their brand is trying to be. Again, they're working within the framework of the personality that that they're trying to, to espouse. So um, it, you can't have something that has a real strong dichotomy between how you want to be perceived and how you're behaving in the online environment. A very uh, high-end luxury hotel that appeals to the well-heeled traveler using that Wendy's approach would probably backfire. Right. No, absolutely. Good, great point. Uh, you know, and, and it's the same thing, obviously, with, you know, some of these bigger airlines we've seen, especially in the last several months, some really, really bad PR. And, and we've seen a couple of these major airlines handle it really well on social media. And then we've seen a couple bomb and <laughs> United. Just, they yeah. they <laughs> they took they took the route of being this faceless corporation with no human right. touch. And I mean, the, the ramifications were huge so much so that, you know, I think a couple of top tier people at, the, at, at United lost their positions and, and, and now they have this huge PR nightmare because of what they've done on social media and what they've done in real life. But what their reaction on social media, what they did on social media led them to, you know, trying to completely break down and rebuild it. And right. I think it's failing. It's, no, it's not good at all for United because nobody likes any of the airlines, it seems like, out there. But when you're like least out of all of the airlines, it's a real serious problem. Um, now, United's name is synonymous with beating up passengers and handling these situations poorly. <laughs> so they're almost giving the other airlines free pass to get away with um, mistakes. I'll put that in air quotes, right? Um, but... Uh, because United is the ones that are going to be, you know, brought up again and again and again. Now, our, immediately, you're all thinking about there. When I say United, you think bad airline. That is their fault because of the way they handled the situation and they trained the uh, American public to respond to them. Don't be yeah, there. And, and a lot of it happened on social media. Don't you know? Obviously, what happened on those flights and what happened, you know in the airports matters too, but their response that they posted, they, they didn't, they didn't run to the Washington times or the post or the New York times or whatever. And, and release this, they released it directly on their social media for everybody to ingest. And it was so bad and so poorly thought out that it had a ma massive impact. 
Yeah. So uh, I, I guess the closing message is if uh, you're having a PR crisis, make sure you get a PR firm that understands yeah. how to handle a, a crisis and then listen to their advice. <laughs> yeah, correct. Uh, yeah. That, that's why I'm not on PR because I would not be good at that job. Oh, I, yeah. I, I put my I put my foot in my mouth w- way too many, uh, way too many times and way too often. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I've I've had some experience with the PR realm. I'd like to uh, invent a um, a machine called the uh, PRitizer, and any single time you say a statement, it goes through the machine and then comes out cleaned by a PR representative. <laughs> you million, know? million dollar idea, go right? <laughs> now, now you just need to invent AI, and you're good, right? <laughs> Yes. All right. Perfect. So uh, any final words from either yourself or Baxter? Uh, you know, final words is I, I find myself have with my business that I struggle with social media. I know it's a daunting task, especially adding all the other things that you have to do in a daily business, uh, day to day business. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be that daunting if you follow some of these steps and or or listen to some of these guidelines of what not to do. Uh, first and foremost, get someone to help you out, someone that knows this. Uh, it is. It has rapidly become a new career, and there will be people that are in social media uh, marketing for the rest of their lives, something that we didn't have 10 years ago. And and now these people are, are getting an education. They're getting the experience. They, they know what to do and how to do it. Uh, hopefully most of them are, you know, good and not bad, but, uh, there are people and organizations and companies to help you build your business on social media. Right. And I would say, focus on those platforms that you think you're going to get the most engagement. You don't need to be on all of them every single place. Maybe Pinterest is where you want to put your most interest. Maybe it's Instagram. I doubt it's Twitter. Um, um, there seems to be a lot more uh, anger and vitriol coming from that particular channel, but maybe it's Facebook as well. So what's the right combination of things for you? Only you and your brand could understand that uh, where that is. But if you need any help with that, be sure to give Jeff a call over at N Point Multimedia. Jeff, how do we find you? Uh, you can go to endpointmultimedia.com or, uh, you know, get, shoot me an email, jeff at endpointmultimedia.com. Excellent. I, I love that. And I'm really looking forward to you guys sticking around because after the commercial break, we got another great interview. But remember, destiny is in your hands when it comes to social media. And uh, hopefully you won't be like uh, United Airlines. Don't be like United Airlines. We'll be right back after this message. <laughs> Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No vacancy. The hospitality industry's number one podcast will be right back. Hey, everybody. Glenn here. And if you're like me, then I know that you love terrific art. Art that creates a sense of place. Art that tells a story of where you are. Art that adds a level of detail that you can't get anywhere else. And the great folks that do this, Kevin Barry Fine Art Associates. You can find them online at kevinbarryfineart.com and I highly encourage that you check them out. Uh, one recent project that I'm totally in love with is the Fairmont, Washington, D.C., where they created a custom project with a local Local artist, and they created some of this on site. They actually created a multi dimensional wall sculpture from gold blocks, which is an abstracted map grid of the Washington, D.C. area. It's got different elevations to it and looks absolutely fantastic. It was done along with Deborah Forrest and Amanda Jackson of Fars Perkins, which is now Perkins Eastman. And they all work together to create this fabulous new look. So if you want to create a fabulous new look for your hotel, or if you just love great art, check out KevinBarryFineArt.com or give him a call at 310-945-2655. Let him know Glenn sent you. Back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the No Vacancy podcast. This is, of course, Glenn Hausman, your intrepid host. And 
You know what? I have been broadcasting a lot for the last couple of days here in San Antonio, Texas, and I've been having a great time in this town. And by this time, you guys are probably all sick and tired of all the content, and I keep saying San Antonio, San Antonio, a ho event, all that kind of stuff. So I figured I'd take it up a notch today because you can't talk about San Antonio without talking to the de facto expert on San Antonio. <laughs> and I got with myself Cassandra Matei. She's the president and CEO of the Convention and Visitors Bureau here. Welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you for mentioning San Antonio so much. Oh, God, I have been mentioning it like <laughs> crazy because, uh, you know, I was broadcasting here at the Sahoa Convention mm-hmm. and getting lots of great interviews with uh, different hotel company CEOs and that sort of thing. And I'll tell you what, Cassandra, um, I was excited when I first heard that this event was going to be in San Antonio seven, eight months ago. I had an opportunity to come here four or five years ago for a major hotel brand conference, and I absolutely fell in love with this city when it comes to a a convention town. So how cool is this town that you live in here? Well, you know, I think we are a very unique city. You know, I think that there's probably top five cities around the U.S. that you can say has a unique sense of place. And frankly, I think San Antonio is one of them. You know, we have the charm, we have history, we have our culture that we live and breathe daily in everything that we do. And so I think that's one of the reasons that we're such a desirable destination. And especially for the convention scene. Now, we'll talk about why you're desirable for the other reasons, but I do want to get through the convention part of it first because we are in an absolutely gorgeous convention Mm -hmm. center here. And it is spectacular. you got a relatively brand new hotel over there, the Grand Hyatt. You said six or seven yes. years it's been here? That's right. So uh, why such a play for the convention business, and what a huge investment this expansion must have been? So when you think about what convention planners are looking for and those professionals, first of all, we're centrally located in the U.S., right? So, you know, we're fairly easily to get to. Uh, we're growing our airlift um, monthly. In fact, we've, wow. we're about to announce a brand new flight direct nonstop to Toronto. It begins May 1st. So I think, you know, obviously the accessibility, but the reality is, is once you land in our airport, it were only 15 minutes or 10 minutes from the airport. So you can be at your hotel, checked in in a relatively short amount of time. So we're convenient. And I think one of the things I hope that you've experienced this week is that you've not had to get on a bus. You've really not had to get into a taxi. You just have to use your two feet. We have a very compact hotel package that is right around the, this wonderful convention center. And I want to thank you for doing that for me. And uh, <laughs> I, As a New York guy, I'm a, a walker, right? Yeah. So it's always, I always have the inclination to walk. And when I'm in a city where I have to keep getting in the cabs all the time, it's not as much fun for me. Not, not that I don't love you cab drivers out there. I think sure. you do a great service. But for me, the convenience of being able to walk from place to place is uh, really fantastic. Well, and, and think from a, a meeting planner's purview or an association's purview, it saves the money. Because in some cities, they may have a huge shuttle um, bill right. versus we do not. And so I think that's advantageous for conventions. And I want to know all about why you think um, folks within that uh, part of the world, uh, you know, the way convention people really like working with you. You know, I find that one of the reasons why I like it is that Riverwalk area is pretty darn cool. And again, in the convention context, I think about having the event here at the convention center during the day and not having to stray too far for the dinners and the drinks and the bumping into people. And that is such a cool uh, little environment over well, there. Well, you know, we actually call the Riverwalk the largest hotel lobby in the country because it does serve that purpose, That's right? That's a great term for it. <laughs> it is because if you think about a part of a goal for attendees at conferences is networking and doing business yeah at every aspect. And so you can connect, meet up right along the river because all our convention center is located on the river and so are many of our key hotels. So that makes it really promising to meet up with people, have meetings, enjoy different types of dining, etc. all in this area where this, the river actually runs through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it was one of my uh, favorite movies, but no, I never even, <laughs> never even saw that movie. Too much drama for right, me. Right, you know, right. I like those meaningless comedies and speaking of meaningless comedies I'm still looking for the basement in the Alamo (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, speaking of the Alamo, yeah. something that you know people don't realize, w- next year is 2018, and we will be celebrating our tricentennial, so 300 years of being in existence. And part of that is getting... And 300 years of never wanting to be with America. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we are a very friendly state. Texas welcomes all. Yes, of course. And we invite you to come back anytime. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, to, to bring it back to the, uh, the Alamo, 
um, a major hotel company, a Wyndham Hotels group, did an event at the Alamo last night, which I didn't get to go to. But how cool is that for convention planners to be able to have such a historic place as a backdrop for a winning event? You're exactly right. The Alamo is among one of our unique venues. And again, you can walk to it from the convention center or from your hotel. Right. We have La Villita, which is a historic uh, town that uh, is right along the river and right outside the convention center. Another venue that can do events up to you know 3,000 people. So I think that makes us very unique that they ha- we have special unique venues that are part our history, but we will open up for events. And the Alamo is only going to get better. With its historic you know, relevance and importance to our state and to our country, they're about to do a project. They're reimagining the Alamo. And in fact, the master plan just uh, was released this week uh, while you're here. So how do you reimagine a uh, historic artifact? Believe it or not, probably once or twice a year in our visitor center, somebody will ask, uh, why did you put the Alamo in downtown San Antonio? Oh, my God. <laughs> so we know that San Antonio built up around the Alamo. Right. Well, one of the things is really to make sure that people understand the original footprint. Mm-hmm. So they are going to develop and recreate its original footprint because what people historically think of the Alamo, they think of the church. Yes. And that's not just, that's not the case. That's a portion of the entire mission. The whole thing was a, yeah, a mission fort. It was a mission a, fort. That's correct. Right. That that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, fortunately, you're not in Vegas. Otherwise, they just knock it down and build a bigger and better uh, <laughs> Alamo. I'd probably uh, charge you for parking, uh, too. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but what do I know? All right. So um, anything else that we should know about the convention type scene and why it might be a, a great place for conventioners to go to? Well, I, I would be remiss if we yeah. didn't talk about, you mentioned you're in the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention yep. Center, and we really just unveiled its renaissance or this reformation of the building. We're sitting right now in the new. We, we expanded. We now have 515,000 square feet of exhibit space, and it's just beautiful. Um, again, it's convenient. It's flexible. We, in fact, had a board of customers, our customer advisory board, help give input on what the design, the functionality of this new portion of the building should look like. And I think it's turned out great. So we have the flexibility. We can accommodate mostly about 80% of the meetings market. So there's no reason why you can't come to San Antonio. And I also will say this, because, you know, we are a strong leisure destination, Mm -hmm. but I think that's what makes us a strong convention destination. There is a destination draw for people to want to come and attend the conferences and meetings here, but have a unique destination to explore. Right, and I think that plays into the larger trends that we're seeing in the hospitality industry of people wanting to have that real localized experience. It's no longer good enough to live your life like me. Everyone always says, uh, hey, what would you think of that town? I said, it looked nice from the cab ride to the (laughs) conference room, (laughs) right? But today, these days, people really want to go and experience different cultural institutions, the dining that's there, real food. I'm going to go out and have some Tex-Mex tonight for for example. Uh, yeah, you know, because I've, I've had enough of the convention food. Not Nothing against convention food. It's really spectacular. No, it's not. But, you know, uh, I do want to have some of that local cuisine as well. So tell me a little bit about how people are experiencing the destination between the convention business and then going to have that more leisure aspect. Well, one of the things you mentioned is that one of the hotel companies had an event at the mm-hmm. Alamo. A lot of our institutions, uh, number one, are reinvesting in themselves. And so, for example, we have a Texas Heritage Museum called the Witty Museum, and it tells the history of San Antonio and mm-hmm. the state of Texas. And it also is utilized as a special venue, and again, it's along the river. The fact that the river walk that a lot of people in probably once you you were here last wasn't it was probably three miles at that point now we've activated and grown the path to 15 miles what so on one end of the river you can actually kayak along the san antonio river and be right in front of many of the other spanish colonial missions that are now a unesco world heritage site or you can head up to the Pearl, which used to be the Pearl Brewery, which is now a 22-acre mixed-use development of restaurants, nightlives, bars, very unique living. And I highly recommend you check that out while you're here. So there's so many things. And, and what's the anchor of the Pearl is the Culinary Institute of America, and they focus on Latin cuisine education. And so it has really 
bursted our culinary scene into a fabulous um, way to, you know, enjoy the flavors of the city. So speaking of the flavors of the city, hard-hitting question, how do you make a really good enchilada? Okay, I'm not an expert, but I know where to get them. All right, all right. And we'll talk about that uh, off the air because okay. I don't want you to, uh, you know, pitch one company Thank and you. put yourself in a very uncomfortable <laughs> position. Or I could ask a question and I'll get back the classic answer. They're all great. They're all great. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like. All right, so um, how is it like competing for business against all these other major markets? I joked around about the Las Vegas market, but they attract a lot of big conventions. You've got a lot of big cities out there. How do you try to break through that clutter and shine through? You know, we, we say a lot that, you know, the competition is fierce out there for the convention dollar, for the tourism dollar. And so you do have to be top of your game. I do feel like our city leaders, as well as the private institutions, are reinvesting in themselves constantly. Obviously, the renovation and the the investment of the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center to make it a top-tier convention center. Is there a Henry A. Gonzalez? Do we have to, to clarify not, it? They're okay. not. Um, and, and as well as our hotel products, yeah. they're reinvesting. I mean, the mayor Marriott's, the Hilton, the Grand Hyatt, they're all reinvesting in their product to make sure that we stay at a top tier and that and that we're that choice. And then that ultimately, I think one of the ways that we're competitive is we're very easy to do business with. Our people are fantastic and we want your convention to be very successful and visit San Antonio or if it's the services people at the convention center, we all want your event to be success. So I think that's very important. And then on top of all of that, mm-hmm. because if you look at it, we have the we have the affordability, we have the walkability, and we have the people. What other choice would you make but San Antonio? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you do want to visit San Antonio, how does visit San Antonio help? if you're going to try to prepare a uh, conference or major event. You know, we're proud to partner with you on many ways. We can make sure that we send your information to all of our partners. We can connect you and be the liaison uh, to our museums, to our hotels, to the convention center. We can help you promote your convention. We can give you local media ties and regional media ties. We can even be your nonstop if you have a corporate responsibility program. We have a lot of relationships with all the nonprofits within the city. The list goes on and on. The reality is we can be an extension of your team and we're that four-letter word, free. Yeah, and it (laughs) sounds like a a really great resource in the sense that so many people now as part of their conventions, the cornerstone of it is finding some sort of charitable way to give back and you're able to provide that conduit. We are. I mean, and I think that's very important. A lot of times when we're talking to legislators about our industry, we think you talk about how it's big business, not only the conventions themselves, but what they bring to our community. We had a conference of dentists that brought us almost half a million dollar of free dental uh, activities for the for many of our citizens. So it's very important. Yeah, that's a, that is a, that is important. I love that you help in those different kind of ways that I don't think people necessarily think of. They think I got to plan a, con- a convention at a convention center, but they don't realize that it. A, a visit San Antonio and other CVVs can be a valuable resource. And frankly, we're the expert of the destination. Of course. We know what's going on. And if you're booking a convention five years from now, we know what's happening in our city five years from now. There's Ooh. so much development. Great For point. example, right outside the convention center doors, it will be Hemisphere Park. And it's starting to activate and grow and a lot of development. And it's going to be a huge downtown park for conventioneers to do for events. It's going to be um, appealing for our travelers as well as our citizens. Well, that's, a, that's that's really nice. How big of a park is that supposed to be? I think it's going to be in total, oh, about 10 acres, I believe. Well, that's pretty, yeah. it's pretty sizable. It's huge. It's huge. Mm-hmm. And how's that going to complement the, uh, the Riverwalk complex, do you think? Of course. It, it is just an extension. You come up off the, the river and you can enjoy this downtown green space. And again, for conventions, it's another venue right outside the door for yeah. of the convention center. Uh, I mean, Cassandra, I have a big crush on your city. I really, uh, Thank you. I really like this uh, town. It's a, it's a lot of fun, and you know, quite frankly, I go to some cities, and I don't really want to leave my hotel room. But uh, there's something about being here that I really want to walk around. And the first time I was here, just walking around the whole Riverwalk complex on my own was just so calming. 
you know? Yes. Except for all the people enjoying themselves in the restaurants and the bars <laughs> on the water. But other than that, <laughs> I felt it was really, really uh, a calming, soothing type of experience. And sure. just really kind of mellow. All right, listen. I have a listener question that I've been told that I have to, uh, oh. to ask okay. you. I, this person is really curious about some of the best practices a CVB can incorporate to be more successful. Best practices that we can incorporate. Yeah, what could, that they could take. What are some of your best practices that you make sure that your organization is running really smooth, it's as productive and successful as possible? Well, that's interesting. Yeah. First and foremost, it's the team that you build. Mm-hmm. Um, that is what I feel like makes Visit San Antonio the strongest. We, we have an amazing team that cares about what they're doing. If you employ the right team, you're going to reach your organizational goals. I also think you have to have a collaborative approach um, in, in the sense that there can be the best idea for your organization, for the destination coming from anywhere, not just executive leadership. So those are two things that I think that we certainly have in our culture. Uh, We also live and breathe, hire, and sometimes have to say goodbye to a a talent if they're not following our core values. So setting the core values, making sure your team has input of what those core values are, I think are very important. And then it goes back to what is the organization going to look like five and 10 years from now. You mean when I'm booking my next convention here. (laughs) Versus what it is today. And I think sometimes we forget to thinking about that vision because our world, especially in a CVB DMO world, we're ever changing. And so I think that's true for any association is that you've got to make sure that you're not just looking at the short term, but what is that long term? And do you have the right volunteers in place, such as your board of directors? You know, that is in a lot of ways will help your organization move very smoothly. Excellent. And you uh, have great team members who are we're sitting with one now who you can't see, you can't hear, but he uh, comes from the Las Vegas market. It must be great to get team members that you can tap into their expertise from such great convention cities too. Absolutely. I mean, th- we do have several um, team members that have come to San Antonio. They're passionate about our industry, but they do have other market perspective and we can only grow from that. And I do think as an employer, you have to start being more flexible. Uh, you know, there's some people that just aren't that morning person. So if you make them to come in at eight, but yet they don't start working till 10, you know, you're, you're losing out on what you can get from productivity from them. Yeah, you, you <laughs> certainly are. Well, I'm not much of a morning person or an go. afternoon person or an evening person. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I shouldn't be applying for a job with you guys, but right. I mean, maybe, I, maybe I will. Maybe sure. I'll, you know, if I can work from, do you hire anyone that works from like midnight to 4 a.m.? It just depends yeah. on their role. That's right. If they're working on our website, we can yes, talk. That's right. <laughs> that, that, makes a lot of, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, all right. So how can people find Visit San Antonio? How can they learn more about the city, the great things in the city, and maybe even how to book a convention here? Well, as easy as going to visitsanantonio.com. Wow. That, you really <laughs> simplify this, Cassandra. <laughs> Any other uh, final words? No, we'd just like to invite you to come to San Antonio anytime. And, and if we have an opportunity to bid on anyone's convention, please give us a call. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you for being here. Sure. Uh, Sandra Mate. That's right. It. I like that you said it rhymes with a latte. I always get confused when you have a J at the end of a name. I, I, know. I never know how to approach that. I feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> but you came right in. You made me feel at home. And I want to thank you so much for being here. I had a great time talking to you today. Thank you very much. And I also want to big, uh, have a big shout out to everybody out there watching. I've had a great time here in San Antonio. I'm going to run this interview last because, you know, you are the San Antonio uh, chieftain over here, really pulling this whole city together in a fun, exciting thing, exciting times. I want to thank all of you guys for listening, for watching, participating in the No Vacancy podcast. Podcast, do me a favor, give me that five star ratings on iTunes. I'm desperate for attention. You know I need it. So give me those five stars. Spread the word to your family, to your friends. Grab some strangers on the street. Let them know they got to tune in. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. It is unless I decide to uh, start building that park right by Riverwalk and become part of the San Antonio scene. See you next week, guys. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.